Sato, Nai Mai, Haere Mai. Welcome everyone. My name is Dora Vera and I'm the manager of Insight and Marketing at the Trans Tasman Business Circle. I'm delighted to welcome you here today to today's virtual briefing with the Honourable Stuart Nash, Minister of Police, Revenue, Fisheries and for Small Business and MP for Napier. Thank you for being our guest of honour today, Minister. Now for the housekeeping. Thank you. Now for the housekeeping. Um, for our regulars, um, our people that have just joined us um, for our virtual event, um, you can see there's a Q&A feature down the bottom and you can also upvote questions that have already been asked. I'd also like to thank our Vevent series, um, series partners, Commonwealth Bank of Australia, IBM, Red Hat and ServiceNow. Without your support, this series would not be possible. I'd now like to pass on to our supporting partner of today's briefing, Gavin Lennox, Group Chief Executive Officer of the ISL. Thank you, Dora. Um, it gives me great pleasure today on behalf of the Ice House and the Trans Business Partner uh, events to welcome the Honourable Stuart Nash. Um, prior to entering politics, you also worked in, in management in small and large organisations and in both private and public sector. Your wide ranging career has placed you in great stead for preparing SMEs to thrive in the current environment. I believe in your maiden speech, you described yourself first and foremost as a public servant, employed by the people of New Zealand as a social democrat, committed to sustainable economic development and growth. And as you know, New Zealand is a country of small and medium-sized businesses. In that context, the Ice House was founded almost 20 years ago to help grow New Zealand's economy by supporting that sector. We're committed to creating a high-performing New Zealand economy where ideas and businesses thrive. We believe that to unleash the ec economic potential of New Zealand, we need to lift the capabilities, aspirations of both owners and entrepreneurs, the people who run small and medium-sized businesses in New Zealand. We sincerely appreciate your time today and certainly look forward to the conversation. I'll now hand over to Nicole, who will begin today's discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Gavin. Um, Minister Nash, I had the pleasure of sitting on your Small Business Council last year, so I'm very pleased to be oh. here um, today to, to talk about small business um, today. Um, so I wanted to start off um, with a question around um, the current crisis. Um, and you know, what surprised you the most um, about New Zealanders during COVID-19? Well, first of all, um, it's great to be here, Nicole. You, you and the other members of Small Business Council did an absolutely fantastic job of actually defining the issues and coming up with solutions, including, of course, Andy Hamilton, who is the CEO of the Ice House, and, and Dr. Deb Shepard, who is the Deputy Chair and does a lot of work with the Ice House. So thank you very much for your work. Hugely appreciate and form part of the, an, an integral part of our work program going forward. To your question, um, actually the thing that really surprised me is how everyone bought into the reasons for why we were doing what we were doing. And, you know, I, I understand, I, I'm, everyone in government was acutely aware that by going into level four lockdown, there were a lot of businessmen and women out there who were doing it incredibly hard and still are because of that. But they understood that, in fact, it wasn't about the economy or the health of our country. It was about both. And if we got one right, if we got the health of the country right, then our economy would come out faster. And the fact that we bought into it, I mean, I, I know the term a team of five million has been uh, used a lot uh, and maybe overused now, but at the time it was so relevant because everyone was doing, well nearly everyone, 99.9% .9 of people were doing exactly what we were asked to do because we knew that the consequences of not doing it were grave. Absolutely, absolutely. It was certainly a much more cohesive approach than, than the rest of the world, I think. Um, and then the next question is uh, introspective. So what have you learned about yourself through the pandemic? Well, well, I learn if I try and work from home, I put on about five kgs and I eat a block of cheese in three days. So that, that doesn't work. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it's, it's been incredibly busy. So there hasn't been much time to sort of sit back and reflect on, on what's happened as a government. I mean, there was an, there was an enormous amount of work underway uh, by every cabinet minister in terms of coming up with solutions to the issues that we were facing or we knew we were going to face. Um, I suppose the thing that, I mean, I'm a, people, I'm a politician, I'm a people person. I love the inter interacting with people. And I love meeting people and I love, you know, having a, having a coffee or a wine with my mates, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, we couldn't do that because we were literally in our bubble and I was with my kids and my wife and it was good to re-engage with them for the first time in a long time. 
But I also found that when I was working without that sort of, um, the energy you draw from other people, I was just as productive. So, you know, it was, um, it was an, an interesting and a unique time of that, there's no doubt. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I want to switch now to the topic of small business. So, so we congratulate the government uh, on moving quickly with the wage subsidy uh, and all of the other support initiatives um, for small business. Um, what's the most recent advice um, you've received from the Treasury on the likely impact of COVID-19 on the New Zealand economy and specifically SMEs? Yeah, well, we, we do know that we're heading into recession, um, uh, a significant recession. We know GDP is dropping by about 4%, which is substantial. Uh, tax, the, the, the revenue we're collecting obviously is dropping in line with that. Um, as my, we're my Minister of Revenue hat. Uh, unemployment, we were forecasting at one point to be around 10%, keeping in mind pre-COVID it was below 4%. That seems to be revised down a bit to, um, to around 8%. Uh, you know, we're cautiously optimistic that we're coming out of this uh, a little bit better off than maybe initial forecasts, but Again, we'll have to wait and see what happens when the wage subsidy comes off. I mean, talking to a number of small businesses in Napier, Wellington, and Auckland, where I spend you know, most of my time, I suppose, um, all you know, businesses from you know, from retail to hospitality. And, and when I say that, I am sort of putting to one side the hospitality and accommodation businesses that rely on overseas tourists. You know, you get places like Queenstown, which are significantly reliant on on the overseas market. But in Napier, for example, we're a tourist town, but we're 80% of our tourists are domestic. Um, the bars are doing well. They had a, pre, a post COVID spike and they expected that to die down and it hasn't. Um, talking to a, a men's retail store here, for example, last week, and they had a pre COVID spike as well. And again, they thought that that would die off. It hasn't. Uh, and keeping in mind, you know, we are in the middle of winter. And so there is an expected drop in retail sales, but they're saying that they're having great months. Having said that, I am well aware that there are a number of small businesses that are still struggling. Uh, and it will be interesting to see what happens when the wage, the second round of the wage subsidy does end, because there are predictions that we will see unemployment rise and we, we will see um, the economy take another dip. But, you know, no one's too sure on this because, you know, we're, we're in uncharted territory at the moment. Absolutely. And leading on from that, um, you know, there's been a lot of um, disruption and in resulting innovation. Um, mm. And we like to think of ourselves in New Zealand as, you know, a small but innovative country. Um, the Minister for Small Business, you know, how do you think SMEs could benefit from the latest disruption um, and innovation? Look, it's a, I mean, you know, you work one of the most innovative uh, companies in the country, Nicole. And the thing that um, I suppose really highlighted the thing that was highlighted during COVID, certainly, certainly levels three and, and for some two, is that if companies were digitally enabled, and I suppose and by that I mean you know you had a, a click and collect or click and deliver deliver type facility, then um, you were able to get some revenue in, probably not enough to cover cost, but at least you had some revenue. Without that, without a level of digital enablement, then you were really struggling. And if you look at the, you know the the innovation cycle or the innovation adoption cycle. I think that's probably been turned on its head because some of the late, late adopters or the, or the laggards, uh, I think now are open to, to seeing how they can use digital technology and digital innovation to drive their business model forward. I mean, one of the things I do outside of government is I chair the OECD's Digitization for Small Business work, work program. And so I get an overview around what's happening across the developed world in this. And my vision for New Zealand small businesses is to be the most digitally enabled in the world. And it sounds quite grand, but I do believe that's possible. But we have a small window of opportunity at the moment that I think we can, um, we, we can take advantage of, which will help small business owners who traditionally uh, are late adopters or who think that you know, the government is not here to help, the government just gets in the way. There's an opportunity now to bring them on board and drive their level of growth in a way that we wouldn't have been able to do pre-COVID. Yeah, and, and in fact, we have a question uh, from the audience related to this uh, from Andy Hamilton. Um, <laughs> so historically, we saw that you know lots of SMEs were not really into digital, which obviously there's been a shift now uh, mm. to how do I do this digital thing. But are there specific um, initiatives, or what's the government's approach to how to support and enable um, SMEs on mass to go digital? 
Yeah, well, first of all, I would say that um, I don't see the government as a deliverer of solutions or, or the provider of all the solutions, because we simply do not have the capacity, don't have necessarily the competency, um, and we certainly don't have all the good ideas. So I've um, been talking to my officials about the government as an enabler and a partner. And by that, I mean, we go out there to, with organisations that do have the ability to deliver, do have a lot of the good ideas, and we provide them with the mandate to do this under a certain set, set of criteria, obviously, and work with us to deliver solutions in a way that will drive business growth and optimization and allow digital uptake. And let, let me just give you one example. Um, you know, we, we have got to provide a safe place for people to learn how to use these digital tools. I mean, there's no point in, you know, in a 24-year-old tech expert coming on a webinar and talking to a whole lot of agribusiness um, you know, old grizzled agribusiness guys or, or, or plumbers or, you know, trades that traditionally don't, uh, don't adopt digital tools but would benefit hugely from them and trying to talk to them in a language they don't understand. I mean, we, we, we're starting night classes again. We need to use people from within the same industry and demographic of those who we want to adopt digital tools. So it's providing a safe environment for, um, for people to actually learn how they can do things better, but within that safe environment, if you know what I mean. Look, absolutely, absolutely. And, and I take your point on sort of industry specific as well. Mm. Uh, and and um, talking about the private sector, so are there ways that the private sector specifically and government um, can help small businesses digitize in a way that's more effective together? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, I think if, um, you know, the, the government certainly cannot do this on its own, and if it tried to, it, it would be seen as arrogant and it, and it wouldn't be able to achieve the results that I think we need to achieve. Partnering with organisations like Xero, like the Ice House, uh, maybe, maybe tertiary institutions, any organisation that has the ability to deliver, and I'm not just talking about um, deliver programmes, I'm talking about partnerships, um, communicate in a way that uh, people will engage, you know, this is who we're working to, looking to partnership with, to partner with. You know, if I'm going to use your, your business, Nicole, because, you know, I know it, but I'm not signaling that out as, as special or not, but, you know, Zero has uh, massive insights into what is happening in the small business sector in our country. And, you know, we can use your insights and we can partner with Zero to understand what sort of policy settings we need to put in place to help small businesses move forward to the next level. And, you know, Craig's talked about this, you know, the, the amount of people that use Xero is huge, but he also says the number of businesses that use the data analytics that come out of the information that's generated uh, is very, very small. And we need to morph that forward so people are actually using the data to make better management and business decisions. Yeah, look, absolutely. That data is very, very important. Um, and there's there's a there's a question actually that's come from the audience. Um, so there's lots of talented Kiwis coming home. Um, so as well as the private sector, do you see ways that we can take advantage of their skills um, to new industries? Like absolutely. The, the, the Prime Minister on Sunday outlined our sort of five pillars for um, for, for economic growth and recovery, and one of them was supporting small businesses, entrepreneurs, and those who create growth. And what we do know is a lot of Kiwis are coming back who are bringing a whole lot of you know, fantastic skills that, that will help grow our economy forward and make it more resilient, uh, which is what we need. And um, you know, there are a number of ways we can help them. First and foremost uh, is you know, the Regional Business Partner Network. If I was a Kiwi who was sitting in a hotel in isolation at the moment, because you know, you've got to be in isolation for 14 days, the first thing I'd be doing is I'd be going online and saying, okay, what are the organizations that exist in this country that will allow me to better understand uh, what's available, what the market dynamics are, uh, who I can perhaps tap into to get uh, a level of expertise, if there's any money, what the training is. I'd, I'd get in touch with my chambers of commerce. I'd, I'd take a look at business.gov.nz and look at all the resources on there. I'd be talking to my business partner network. There are a number of, um, um, there are a number of organizations uh, around our country that I think could be very, very helpful to Kiwis coming back, looking to get a foot in the door, but not quite understanding the country they left maybe 10 years ago when they went on their own. Right, absolutely. Um, so back to the main question. So to drive jobs and future economic activity through accelerating R&D commercialization, what should we invest in and how would this investment be best directed? 
Well, it's again, I'm going to come back to the, the key theme. It has got to be in digital tools. One of the things that, that maybe some of the people on the, um, on the call will have heard me say is that I think this will be the last generation of business owner that will survive, let alone thrive, without being digitally enabled. So we'll, uh, in the gone of the days where you need to spend you know, half a million dollars with, a, with a, a big warehouse at the back of your office with, with massive computer stacks, the tools needed these days to get data that will allow someone to make good business decisions are very cheap. The cheapest they have ever been by a long shot. So there, there are a number of things that businesses need to invest in. First of all, their own capability and, and competency. And you know, what the Small Business Council actually highlighted was that a number of small business owners said that they just didn't have the time or the energy to engage in any form of, um, you know, uh, of outside of work education. Now, I think you've just got to create the time because you know, if you spend all day looking inwards and trying to run your business without understanding what's going on outside that and trying to increase your level of competency, then you're possibly going to get left behind. I, you know, I, I think, Nicole, that what's going to happen is we are going to come out of this. We are going to come out of this a lot more resilient than we, are, than we were. And when I say come out of this, I'm not talking about in 12 months. I'm talking about, you know, three to four to five years. Let's be honest about this. It is going to take us a long time to get the economy back up again. But once it is, those businesses that I think will really thrive, large and small, will be the ones that, that um, engage with digital tools and understand their markets and their customers in a way that perhaps pre-COVID businesses didn't. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and then, um, you know, in New Zealand, we've taken a different approach from, from in the rest of the world. What does our response give New Zealand in terms of political and economic advantage? And how can we make the most of that? Well, two things. First of all, internally, you know, we've opened up. We, we were the first in the world to have 45,000 people at Eden Park watching a, a rugby match, okay? And there was no social distancing there. So we did the really, really hard yards to allow us to open up our economy and have one of the, mo the most open economies in the OECD at this point in time. And we did an experiment with our population. We didn't do a Sweden and say, well, you know, maybe we can keep the economy open, get a little bit of herd immunity and see where we end up. It looked really good to start with. And now the Swedes are saying, shivers, maybe we've got this wrong. So by going hard and going early, it allowed us to open our economy a lot earlier than in other economies. And I see that Melbourne has gone into the equivalent of a level four lockdown for another three weeks. The other thing that I think uh, we, the government has really got to, got to move on is what this has done for our global brand. You know, let's be honest, having a moat around the country the size of the Pacific and the Tasman Oceans has been very helpful. But what we have seen and what, what the media has shown overseas, is, uh, as reported on overseas, is that we have knocked this off. You know, we have done incredibly well as a country to, to pretty much conquer COVID, well, eliminate it. Um, and so that will play into our already good brand for integrity, for quality. Uh, and when I mean quality, I mean quality of systems as well as quality of products. And I think, you know, I think this is just another well, very important part of the brand attribute that we take to overseas markets. But we can also use it to attract business to New Zealand. Um, obviously not at the moment because, uh, you know, we're struggling to fit the kiwis that are coming back into our hotels. But at some point in time, businesses are going to have a good, um, when I talk about business, I talk about global businesses, are going to have a good hard look at where they want to locate for the next 20, 30, 50 years. And they're, they're possibly going to have a look at, okay, where are the educated workforces? Uh, you've got to have stable government, you've got to have a stable uh, monetary system, obviously. But also, you've got to have a safe environment to work in. And what the world is now reading about New Zealand is we are you know, one of the safest countries in the world at this point in time. And I think that is a huge benefit when we post COVID when we go out and look at attracting foreign direct investment. That, I think that is certainly becoming, becoming extremely apparent. I know having spent most of my career abroad, I'm contacted daily by, by friends saying just that. Um, right, let's turn to um, some more questions um, from the audience. So. Um, you've shared that you're a people person. Um, could you share with us some of the inspiring moments from small business people that you've engaged with? Well, let me tell you about one. Look, I'm interested to see if a lot of the, um, uh, if, a, if a lot of the comments, a lot of the uh, promises that people made to themselves and their families during COVID uh, will translate going forward. 
Um, and a lot of the resolutions I spoke, let me give you one example. I, I talked to a businessman who has, um, he's, a, he's a wholesaler into the cafe trade. He has businesses in Australia and New Zealand, and he was operating out of a, a makeshift home office in his garage. And he said, this is the first time ever in his career that he has worked from home, but he has never spent so much time with his family and his children as he had during lockdown. And he said, when he goes back, he wants to set up his, his program where he works four days a week and spends three days a week at home with his family. Now, I think we all thought that, certainly you know, people like me, I'm, I'm away the whole time and I've got a young family. You know, I've got a six-year-old and, and an eight-year-old and I don't get to see them much. And it was fantastic spending time with them. Um, all by it, it was, you know, I was still working in, late into the, into the night, but I could go home for dinner and sit down with him and engage with him for a couple of hours. Now, I really enjoyed that, but, and I'm assuming a lot of people on the call will say, you know what, engaging and spending time with my family was really, really valuable. And I wonder in two years' time whether we'll look back at this time as sort of unique as, as a moment in time, or we'll look back as, as the point in when we changed a lot of our work habits. It'll be interesting to see. Look, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so there's a question here, um, somewhat tied to the last one, but are there, what are some of the most innovative responses that you've seen from, from small businesses in this crisis? Uh, well, the Prime Minister herself talks about a cafe that was across the road from Premier House. It's a very small cafe. Uh, th those who know Wellington, it's on, I think, Tinakoi Road. You, you know, it, you could swing a cat in there, you really could, not many guests at all. They did the click and collect model and they found that they had a whole lot more customers that they could, than they would ever have if it was just seated only. And they've decided, for example, to continue with their, their takeout options as well as their seated options because the revenue went up. It's not much more work for the kitchen. It's a, it enables them to, um, to leverage off uh, the assets they've got there and a lot more profitable. Now, that's, that's just one example, but there are other... Again, businesses, there's a company in Maker, it's a manufacturing company that makes um, stuff for the, for the dairy industry. They move to making uh, respirators or parts for respirators. So the way that um, New Zealanders will, will be able to, you know, we were able to think outside the square and use the current tools that we had to make new products that were fit for purpose at that point in time. I think it showed, a, it showed an adaptability which was quite surprising, pleasantly surprising. Yep, look, absolutely. Um, and there's a question around, do you see any, whole, any new whole industries developing as a result of, of the crisis um, that maybe SMEs can, can create? Well, I, you know, I think in times of great change, there does come opportunity. Um, if I had any massive insights into where they would be, I'd possibly leave and jump into them. <laughs> but look, there's, I, I, it is hard to know. I mean, I, I saw a lot of changes in the ECME scene pre-COVID, and that is the use of digital platforms. In a, in a case I offer, a story I often use is a woman in Gisborne who was making honey and selling it on Alibaba and doing incredibly well. You know, in the pre-Alibaba, she would have to have a massive warehouse stored in China, a whole lot of agents over there. In fact, it would be impossible for a woman, for a woman from Gisborne to do what she was doing. But with these online platforms, it's transforming um, marketing and markets for our small businesses to get into. I see that as increasing substantially. And I also think that a lot of Kiwis now that, who perhaps didn't use online shopping before will begin to use that more um, purely for the convenience sake, if nothing else. So I think that businesses absolutely have to look at their own business model around how they engage with customers. And you know, maybe there is a space for those, for those returning Kiwis who have an expertise in IT to, to utilize their skills to help small businesses um, grow. But, but the one thing I would say is, I think the way that small businesses engage with the world, certainly in products that can't be replicated, and New Zealand honey is a classic case, uh, there's massive opportunities for them. Yeah, we still do need to continue to, to think about the world and how we do that in a digital way. Yeah. Um, excellent. Uh, there's a question around, um, around urban and regional differences for SMEs. So were there sort of, differences for urban and regional um, SMEs? Uh, how are they different? Uh, and can digital enhance the ability of regional SMEs to compete? Oh, very much so. But this is one thing that we've got to be very clear of as a government. We've got to ensure that, um, that businesses not in the main urban areas have access to ultra-fast broadband, have the ability to work online and deliver, deliver their services and products 
in a way that you can if you're, uh, if you're located in, in the middle of Auckland. There are differences, but, but by and large, it's people working incredibly hard um, making a living. But, you know, we, we do need to get this sorted. Uh, we're a long, skinny country with not many people. That provides us with a whole lot of challenges. Um, you know, telecommunications challenges is a big one. There's actually, um, there's a really good book called Tools and Weapons. It's written by a guy called Brad Smith, who's the president of Microsoft and has been for a long time. And he talks about um, the emerging issues. It was obviously, it was published, I think, at the beginning of last year, so it's still very relevant. But he talks about a lot of the emerging issues around data security, et cetera, et cetera. But he also talks about the mismatch in America, which is similar here, um, with areas with ultra-fast broadband and access to, you know, to, to high-end um, uh, IT tools versus city or well, areas that, that don't have that access. And it's not just businesses, it's also, uh, it's also schools and, uh, and regions. So, you know, um, there will be nothing that creates inequality more than inequality of access to digital tools. So we need to ensure that everyone has best access to, to all the digital tools. Fantastic. There's, a, there's another question relating to the region. So, so as people have moved home to work, um, have you seen greater, greater growth in SMEs in, in the regions or suburbs as people are working from, from home versus, you know, in, in cities? Well, well, I haven't personally seen it. What I would say to anyone is move to Hawke's Bay because, you know, this is the place where the sunshine is, great wine, beautiful beaches, et cetera, et cetera. I suspect what will happen is, uh, you know, people... <laughs> Let me give you an example. I mean, I, you know, I'm from Napier, okay? And I moved from Napier at the end of the seventh form, vowed and declared I would never come back here. And then, you know, you, you do your university training, you go overseas, you see the world, you live in the big cities, and then you look back and you go, you know what? Napier's a fantastic place to bring up your kids and to, uh, to have a great lifestyle. And so we don't need to sell the benefits of the regions to those who grew up in them. What we do need to do, though, is outline the value propositions of living outside the main centres to those who have grown up in the main centres. And it's... Um, it's something that I know uh, the economic development agencies around the country are looking at how to, you know, how to bring people home. But that's, that's when I talk about um, having the infrastructure in place to allow those small businesses in the regions to operate in a way that they would if they were in the middle of Wellington and Auckland, that, that is what's really important. But I think what we will see um, is, you know, if, as people are laid off from senior management positions, um, that they will take a good hard look and go, you know what, this is maybe just the push I've needed to start my own business. So they'll pull back, you know, they won't be in a corporate office, they will be in the home office, they'll understand the sort of the, the value that they can add to a business and they'll drive it forward from there. Look, absolutely. And I think there's numerous examples of, of um, you know, businesses such as Salesforce that were started in recessions. Yeah, yeah. Um, Excellent. So, so there's a question here um, around increased consumer indebtedness. Um, so to what extent do you think that, that um, increased consumer indebtedness to businesses um, will suppress consumer confidence, um, consumer borrowing and spending, and therefore constrain the recovery for small businesses? Yeah. And will the government consider plans to help consumers recover from their increased debt levels? Well... Two things I would say, you know, the, the price of money at the moment has never been cheaper. The cost of money has never been cheaper. I mean, look at mortgage rates at the moment. The, you know, who would have believed five or 10 years ago where we'd be looking at mortgage rates below 3%. So, so you know, $500,000 debt 10 years ago is a lot more expensive than a $500,000 debt now. I think one of the things that will stop consumer spending is the level of uncertainty. Um, again, you know, the banks put in these mortgage holidays or interest only mortgages. Uh, for six months. When they come off, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, you know, we haven't seen any drop in the price of houses at this point in time. Uh, I haven't seen any data around credit card spending. So I'm not too sure if consumers are, are spending more on their credit cards or not, even though, as mentioned, what we are seeing in, in places like Napier and a lot of the retail places around the country is that people are still spending. But I'm not too sure if they're doing that on, out of debt or out of savings, or out of wages and salaries. Um, you know, if you think, you know, we, we put in a small business cash flow loan scheme, but that's for businesses, it's not for people. Um, it will be interesting to see what does happen when things like the wage subsidy comes off, and when things like bank holidays um, sort of uh, disappear. 
But you know, there's certainly no plans at this point to help individual consumers pay down debt. Thanks for that. Uh, now, there's a question that's come in sort of related to the topic that you were speaking about before, about many people going out to start new businesses. And the question is, what's the role of government in this starting up um, and how can government help people with potentially starting new businesses? Yeah, well, the, the classic one is, you know, your regional business partner network. You know, I mean, it was pre-COVID, it was um, matched funding. Uh, Post-COVID, or during the COVID um, recovery period, period we've, we've given $5,000 vouchers, or vouchers up to a value of $5,000. And, and I, see, I see that sort of consultancy uh, advocacy as the main way for someone just to start a business. I mean, you know, everyone has a lot of really good ideas. There's no, well, people have a lot of really good ideas, but translating a good idea into a business is, is the real challenge. And I've, I've got a very good friend who is a, um, a major uh, venture capitalist, and he said he sees good ideas the whole time. The problem is, is when, he, when he asks a couple of basic questions like, now what are your competitors doing? Or what are the other offerings in the market? People just don't have the ability to answer that. And so I think that you know, there are a number of online tools at the moment that, that go through the very simple processes. And business.gov.nz is a classic case. There's some good tools on there to take a look at. So first and foremost, people need to understand, again, what their value proposition is, what their global, or what their, not global, what their competitive advantage is, and how they're actually going to run a business. So they need to get a business model up and running first and foremost. I, you know, I don't want to sound um, harsh, but I think that you know, if, a light, if you have a light bulb moment, and you go straight from there to seeking government support, you may be disappointed. But if you seek to develop that light bulb moment into a business plan, even if it's just a basic business plan, and have an understanding of how you're going to develop this, then you'll find that there is a level of support out there that will help you translate it from business model concept into reality. Yeah, absolutely. That, that upskilling is, is very, very important. Um, there's a couple of questions about baby boomers. Um, so, um, as regards baby boomers, um, is there the scope for them as well to uh, to develop small businesses using the skills they've learnt when they were in the labour force? And then, um, you know, how do, how do we get more in the ear of of, of baby boomers to to transform digitally? Yeah, and, and that's the real challenge, right? So, of course, the scope for baby boomers. I mean, baby boomers are the ones who have you know, 20 or no, what, 30, 40 years experience uh, in the labor market. I mean, they, they bring a whole lot of skills and competencies and experience that I would have thought would be in great need at this point in time. But again, often people have been paid by the man, you know, they've been working for a large company. They haven't had to think about their own money coming in because the paycheck's gone in the bank every fortnight or every month. It's getting used to the new paradigm, which may be a little bit difficult. But again, I would look at some of the tools that are available online. Just start at business.gov.nz, if nothing else, and take a look and see what's available there. That brings 200 odd websites. There's a whole lot of tools there around building a business plan, starting a business, all the sort of stuff you need to know. And in terms of digital, well, goodness me, you know, ask your 15 year old or your 10 year old. But, but I would, you know, I can't stress, and I don't mean to sound glib, but I can't stress enough that I do think that if you're starting a business at, my, at the moment, you have got to understand the digital or the environment within which you're operating and how digital tools are going to help enhance uh, what you do and help you help you grow your business. Absolutely. And I think uh, that that sort of concludes the questions that we have for the audience. Was was there anything else, Minister Nash, that, that you wanted to, to share today in particular around our support for SMEs? You know, first of all, I would say, um, you know, I want to thank every SME owner who has really done it hard out there, but did it hard in the knowledge that they were doing the right thing. And, and you know, it, we don't underestimate the struggle that a lot of small businesses uh, are facing at the moment and the pressures they're facing, whether it's financial pressure, whether it's even mental health pressure. And Zero did some fantastic work around this. We need to understand the value of networks and, and look to leverage off those networks, whether they're business networks or even friend networks in terms of talking through the issues and coming out with solutions. In terms of the government, you know, we, we do have your back here. We, we're working really hard to open up our economy in a way that no other country has been able to. We've extended the small business cash flow loan scheme out to the end of the year. We've got the R&D uh, loans um, up to, I think it's $140,000. There's a lot of money available, but we've got to do it in a way that's fiscally prudent. 
but, but we have got your back here because we know that the only way we are going to recover as a country and employ jobs and keep moving forward is if we all work together. And the government has the biggest checkbook, right? You know, it's the, there are two strategies we could have taken when we started borrowing all this money. One was the austerity and said, okay, we're going to close up shop because we can't afford to spend money. Or the other one is sort of the Keynesian model where we say, okay, we're going to spend a whole lot of money to keep people employed and create a whole lot of jobs and get them spending and get that money churning through the economy. We obviously uh, did the latter and we are spending a lot of money keeping people employed, getting people in the regions up and running, employing people in education. We've said, you know, your, your first year education is free. It doesn't matter how old you are. Regional apprenticeship scheme, we, you know, up to $40,000. So we, we realize that people will have to retrain. Uh, we realize that people need to be engaged in employment and anything we can do to help that, uh, we will look to do. The, the last thing I'd say, Nicole, is we have got a digital strategy um, uh, in the SME space, in the small business space, that will be rolled out soon. Uh, it's an exciting strategy, but it really is one of the government being a partner and an enabler, as opposed to a dictator, um, telling people what they should be doing. We want to work with organizations like yours to help people, you know, find their own solutions and then, then help them uh, reach their goals. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Minister Nash. Um, I will now hand it over to Sharon. Thank you so much, Nicole. And thank you, Minister, for being with us today. Um, for those of you who are familiar with our events, you'll see the business sentiment poll up in front of you now, and I'll share the results of that with you shortly. Um, Minister, it was a lot of fun to have you with us today, so thank you for your time. It was really great to hear more from you about economic, economic recovery and the role of the government, in particular with the spotlight on SMEs, and we're hearing a lot of conversation around that digital space as well, so we look forward to hearing more about that from you in due course. It was also interesting to hear more of your personal experiences around COVID-19, and um, look forward to hosting you live in person soon as well. Nicole, thank you for being with us today. It was brilliant. And I also wanted to thank Gavin Lennox and the ISAS for their support of today's briefing. We have a great partnership with the ISAS and we look forward to doing more with you over the coming months. Uh, so the results of the poll now, how is everyone feeling generally is innovative, which is good. Most of us still believe in the government's doing a great job in this crisis, so that's good, Minister. Uh, 12 months is still the estimate for people's planning of when this pandemic will be over. And 100% of people on the call um, will see benefit from the trans-Tasman bubble and brilliant that we met your objectives today. Um, so thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Thank you to our partners, Commonwealth Bank of Australia, IBM, Red Hat and ServiceNow. And I'll hand over to the Minister for the final words. Look, again, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. I want to thank everyone for the fantastic work they've done uh, for knocking COVID on the head. I wish everyone the very best of luck. Just know the government has your back. Uh, we've always known that uh, we can't save every job and every business, but those who are vulnerable but viable, we want to see them come out of this a lot stronger, a lot healthier, a lot more resistant, and you'll be seeing a lot more from this government around our vision for the future going forward and how we can work with small business and other organisations to ensure that we achieve our outcomes. But thank you very much and stay safe.